Hey folks, thank you for tuning into the Grad School Sucks podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Matthew Carlson, and each week I'll be bringing you conversations that will help grad students like you survive grad school and thrive in a post-grad school career. If you end up enjoying today's podcast, please leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to check out the description of this episode for links to everything that we talk about today. Without further ado, let's start the episode. Well, Elizabeth, thank you for coming on the show. It is great to talk to you today. Could you first just introduce yourself to the listeners and let people know where they can find you online? Okay, so I am Elizabeth Dellery. Uh, Just quick background, I have my PhD in biomedical sciences with a concentration in micro and immuno, uh, and I'm a professor at an osteopathic medical school, uh, and my Instagram handle is punny. It's at PhD, and then like my last name is Delery, D E L E R Y, so it's PhD Delery. I was That's really awesome. proud of that one. I know it's cheesy, but I was really proud of that one. No, I love it. And honestly, uh, whenever we started DMing a year or two ago, whenever it was, your name was how I like remembered you and how you stuck out to me uh, initially. I think I mispronounced it in my head at first, but it was just the like the the pun on PhD definitely caught my attention. Speaking of PhDs, why did you uh, decide to go to grad school, Elizabeth? Where'd that come from? Oh, panic was why I went to grad school. Um, I was pre-med in college. I decided in eighth grade I wanted to be a doctor, like a medical doctor. I saw an x-ray, like was just obsessed. Mm. I asked for medical textbooks for my birthday and Christmas every single year from eighth grade until like college. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I was assaulted in college and mm. it went from straight A student to the semester where it just, I got C's in all of my classes that like, these were my, it was science. It was my field. Like it was things I was interested in. And I, I tanked them and I was so afraid of, you know, not doing well in the MCAT and so afraid of like having to talk about that. Like I'm comfortable talking about it now, but like, I was so afraid of having to, to, to tell a, a med school interview committee that like, Hey, like this year was bad because, of this trauma. Oh, yeah. And like, I felt really bad about that, that I ended up backing off applying to medical school. And like, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was kind of reeling my senior year. And I knew, I mean, like, I'd always love science. And I'd always kind of like, in my head, kind of also toyed with like, maybe an MD PhD, just because I really liked research. And I liked figuring things out. Like I liked helping patients and helping people. But I also really wanted to know why. Like, why mm. are we doing it? Like, why, you know, they have a headache? Why are we giving them mad bill? You know, I'm, I don't just want to follow orders and do it. I want to know why it's happening. Uh, and so I signed up for the GRE uh, like a week before I took it. Like didn't study for it. Like I looked at the math equations, I think once. Didn't study for it. Did pretty well, which did help reassure my confidence. I applied to one PhD program and I got into that one PhD program. Mm. And at that point, I'm like, oh, well, I have no other options. Like this seems cool. Let's try it. Uh, and it also allowed me to be in New Orleans uh, with my family. Um, so I was like, okay, cool. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And I do not recommend doing what I did at all. Um, but it was definitely a panic decision, but it was a pretty cool one, I think. Yeah. Very cool. And did you have any research experiences as an undergrad that kind of like uh, fed into that decision at all? Yeah. I read a really cool book, uh, called survival of the sickest, which was one of my Christmas presents. Uh, and it was talking about how diseases, and, and one of the theories is like how diseases we suffer from now may have actually been evolutionary survival tools mm. way back when. Um, like they propose one theory that I'm not sure kind of still how it stands with diabetes, but that uh, back in the ice age, like obviously if you have more material and solute in your body, your, your freezing temperature lowers. And one theory for how diabetes may have evolved is that, you know, People who were diabetics might have had more insulin or sugar or things like that in their bloodstream, which lowered their freezing temperature, which means they were more likely to survive than their cohorts that did it. Which I was just like, this is so cool. And so I, again, wanted to know why. Uh, and one of the other things presented in the the um, a book was how you know cancer cells need iron and they steal iron from our body. And so my big thing was like, well, crap, well, why don't we steal it back? <laughs> I, like, it just seems like a really dumb question. So I approached one of my professors in, in undergrad and I was like, how do we steal iron from cancer cells? And he was like, well, there are these things called siderophores, siderophores in microbiology that steal iron. They're on bacteria and they steal iron from the host. 
well, maybe we can isolate them. And so just as a for giggles project, uh, I spent a summer trying to isolate uh, siderophores from E. coli. And I just thought it was really cool. And like the fact that he was just so encouraging and I was just like, how can we do this? Like, how can we fight back? And he just encouraged my stupid questions and stupid ideas, stupid ideas. And, uh, found out I liked it and I liked being able to, uh, am I allowed to curse on here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Fuck around and find out, which is yeah, like, exactly. Science. That's part of science. Um, I have an FAFO sticker on my laptop right now. Um, but I was like, that's, it was so cool that I was like, yeah, I like research. So I wasn't like completely opposed to it either. I did think it was cool that I got to figure out why and how. So Very cool. Very cool. And so what was your transition to grad school like? What were your early experiences like? God, it was so bad. I just, oh, I, so I didn't research this program. I was like, it was in New Orleans where I wanted to go. I didn't do any background research on how it functioned. I knew I kind of wanted to do like neuro and neuroscience. Didn't find out until after I joined that apparently the program I picked, while it was supposed to be an umbrella program, didn't actually, wasn't on good terms with the neuroscience program. So I couldn't mm. technically work in a neuro lab, even though that's what I really wanted to. So then I'm like left scrambling of like, oh, like what am I supposed to pick? Um, they were going through a transition period. It's a really good program now. They have a fantastic leadership, but they were going through a transition with like leadership and admin. And there was a lot of disconnect in terms of like, what classes are you supposed to be taking and when and who's teaching them? <laughs> and so the first few, few months, I'm like, I cried all the time. I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. It's so overwhelming. Uh, it was, it was a, not to date myself. It was a while ago. <clears throat> and, uh, it was a little bit before we had a lot more, you know, research into some pedagogical approaches. And so it was, you know, team talk classes and our exams were literally like stapled together. Half of them would be multiple choice and there'd be some like short answer and then an essay. And you could tell who wrote it because everyone's in different fonts, like fonts mm. and sizes. And like, it's just stapled together. And it was just, it was chaos. <laughs> that's funny so when in your grad program did you uh kind of get in your head that you wanted to go <clears throat> excuse me all the way and become a professor i am a very lucky fortuitous whether you believe in god or the universe or karma i think there's always been something kind of putting me on this path um mm. never i'd never considered it I really had never considered it. Going through grad school, I was like, okay. Once I started getting a little bit more comfortable and, and, and more confident in myself and my abilities in academics again, I was like, well, I'll just, you know, go back and get my MD as soon as my PhD is over. And obviously that's, you know, famous last words because you do a PhD. And as you've seen from the memes and the memes that I like on your page, you get jaded uh, and you get burned out and you get tired. And so I never planned on ending up as a professor. Interesting. Okay. So let's, let's maybe push then towards like the later part of your grad program. Um, so you've done your classes, you've done some research, you're working on your dissertation. What was, uh, what was your dissertation process like? I liked it. I, my PhD was a little complicated because I joined one lab. I started out in an immunology lab and it was really cool. We were working on a project looking at HIV and the brain. Um, but that professor got a job at a different institution across the country mm. and due to financial constraints, I wasn't able to move. So midway through my PhD, I switched labs. Uh, and my second advisor is an absolute godsend, uh, probably the most amazing person I've ever met. Um, but he's what a mentor should be, mm. um, you know, really spending time with you. Like he'd be in the lab with you hands on and with larger med schools and things like that. It's, you know, it's typically the postdoc or other graduate students that's teaching you. He's the one in right. the lab with me, hands on showing me things. Um, you know, all this data I'd collected from my first two years that I didn't think was publishable, you know, he helped me restructure. He's like, no, you know, while everyone tries to shoot for a nature paper, you have a lot of great data here that we're going to talk about, like a least publishable unit and like what's needed to have a, you know, take all this stuff together and make smaller projects out of it where you can get published mm -hmm. in, you know, I mean, still decent journals, um, but you're not trying to shoot for nature, which is this all encompassing, like all of your research right. in one. And so I had a lot of publications at that point, uh, which made it easy because his theory for how to do a dissertation, it was, he said it was how he cheated because he's from Scotland and he said, this is what they do in Scotland, that you try to write a review paper first. And then depending on like how many chapters your school needs, you try to get at least those as research papers. And if they're published or at least submitted to a journal, most schools can't fight back on you and say, oh, like this doesn't count as a dissertation. You're like, I submitted it to a journal or it's published. Uh... Like it's clearly good data. So I had a review article for my opening. Like obviously I did tweak it just a little bit more to give more introduction to it. 
uh, then I had uh, two published data papers uh, and then one that was pending and then a discussion just kind of tying it all together. And so each chapter technically was just like one of the published papers, you know, formatted a little bit differently to meet the fact that like a picture has to be on its own page and the figure legend has to be on its own page. Uh, But I thought it was actually one of the smartest ways one could do a dissertation, because I think when you sit down and you're like, I just have to write. It's daunting. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So when, when did you get, uh, get it in your head that you were going to do a postdoc? I didn't know what I was going to do after. And I didn't want to go back to medical school. I was like, I don't feel like studying the MCAT. So it was just kind of like, what can I do in the meantime? Um, so again, I got very lucky. Uh, and I basically reached out to someone I knew at an adjacent school. So I stayed in, I was able to stay in New Orleans because, you know, my family wasn't ready to move yet. Um, and there were, you know, a lot more factors at play. Uh, and so uh, you reach out to a contact and I was like, hey, you know, I'm finishing up. Do you have any openings in your lab? I'm just trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. But, you know, here's my skill set. Uh, and she put me in touch with her department chair who had a lab specifically looking at you know things I was interested in. And... Mm. You know, I found out the morning before my defense that they were interested in me and they really wanted me to come work for them as a postdoc. Um, so it was just kind of, again, happy accidents. It's like I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I just kind of you know reached out to friends. I reached out to networks and just said, hey, why not? We'll try it. See, you know, fuck around, find out, see what happens mm-hmm. and then go from there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I feel like a part of that is like um, it underscores the power of your network like your professional network and like your, you know, your personal brand or reputation as a scientist. And, you know, I think, um, yeah, I feel like that's so powerful. So you did, did you do one year or two years as a postdoc? Uh, it was one and a half years and I got recruited and the pandemic hit about a year into my postdoc. Okay. Uh, Or I started in April, 2019 and the pandemic obviously hit, uh, came to the U S in like 2020. Um, but I was working as a postdoc and like, obviously we were still in lab doing stuff because we were considered essential personnel. Like most of us like completely pivoted our projects to start, you know, we were in new Orleans, um, massive medical institution. All of the med schools are near each other, like all labs, all hands on deck, like trying to come up with antigen testing, all this Mm -hmm. fun stuff. So I was working in, (laughs) I was working in the lab and I was angry because like, obviously my background's micro and immuno and it's the beginning of the pandemic. Everyone has their thoughts about it. And like, there's so much misinformation on science that I got yeah. angry and I made a Twitter, um, which is probably not the best advice. I may have been drinking at the time too, but I made a Twitter and I would tweet about, you know, fighting back science misinformation. And, you know, I've always been passionate about um, medical misinformation and, and anti-vaccine yeah. stances. And so just used a lot of that you know, during the beginning of the pandemic was just treating, you know, tweeting science knowledge and, and talking about the vaccines and some dude slid into the DMs, which in most other instances you would assume is, you know, kind of sketchy. Turns out he was a professor at a medical school and he was a director of a program at a medical school, um, a biomedical sciences master's program. And like, he'd been watching my page because he said he really enjoyed the discussions I was having and sometimes mm. little, you know, fights I would get into. And he just really enjoyed it. He liked my background. He liked how I handled myself and he was hiring a microbiology and immunology professor. Um, And the fact that, you know, I was really big on advocating for students and, you know, mental health and wellness and and wanting it to be a good environment. Grad school, like, you know, my experience was not the best. I wanted to make it better. Uh, His position like was a perfect fit for me. And so in the middle of the pandemic, I, you know, fucked around and found out and moved across the country and started a job as a professor. (laughs) That is awesome. That is so awesome. Um, sorry, I'm making some so notes. The power of social media and uh, networking, and you never know. Like, it doesn't hurt. Like, the worst they can say is no. It doesn't hurt to reach out to your friends and be mm-hmm. like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a job, or I'm not really sure what I want to do. Absolutely. They can put your name out there. They can introduce you. Who knows? You could pick a fight on Twitter and end up with a job, <laughs> yeah. which is the joke that we talk about. <laughs> Definitely. So um, for folks who are wanting to do a postdoc, well, so let's, let's back up a little bit. So a good amount of the listeners are probably going to go to industry, but I think there is a strong portion that do want to stay in academia for the long term. So for folks who want to make that jump to a professor, you know, it's a little field dependent, but most people need to postdoc. So what, 
uh, tips or recommendations would you give people on either finding or acquiring a postdoc? And I think it depends on, depending on like how to pick a postdoc, depends on what kind of professor you want to be. Because I think most people don't realize there's a, a slew of professor positions and you could have anything from a community college professor to maybe a small liberal arts to, you know, a large state school, which would be typically an R01 to even medical schools. I think what a lot of people in academia, like uh, grad students don't hear about as much as osteopathic medical schools, which are still board regulated, you know, they're still considered medical doctors. Um, they're just DOs instead of MDs as their title. Um, but those also hire PhDs to teach. Uh, and because it's kind of a newer field, they tend to not be like R01 institutions. Um, but they do you know, have research labs and are science heavy. Uh, and so those can be sometimes a little bit easier to get into. Um, and so it's just kind of knowing what you want as your end goal helps you determine what you want as your postdoc. So like if you're, your end goal is to be a professor at an R01 big institution with a gigantic lab, you're going to want to be a postdoc at an R01 institution with a big lab you know, that has grant funding and submitting grants a lot because you need to know how that process works. You need to know how to submit grants, how to get funding with a good department. They'll help you do like a K99 R00, which is kind of that transitionary award, you know, leading towards your R01 because it's very hard to get grants as a professor if you've never had that postdoctoral grant experience. Uh, and so especially, you know, and fortunately there's some nepotism in science, but like, you know, you've got that K99 R00, R00 you know, your next step is typically moving into an R01 or an R15 or an R21. And so if that's your end goal to be at an R01 institution, you really should pick a postdoc um, in a place that mimics what the environment you'd want to be in. And that has a good experience and track record of submitting grants and getting funding and helping their students get K99 and R00s. Uh, if your goal is to be at a smaller, uh, like osteopathic medical school, a lot of them don't require you to come in with external funding, which means mm. you would not need to focus as heavily on uh, a postdoc with grant experience. A lot of them expect you to come in with more teaching experience. And so you want a postdoc that does give you more opportunities. So you could look at postdocs at medical schools where it gives you opportunities to teach or postdocs at smaller undergrads where you are allowed to teach more too. So you can get that experience um, to boost your CV. Um, if you want to do liberal arts or com like community colleges, a lot of times will take you directly out of grad school, even without a postdoc. Um, I think their minimum requirement is a master's degree. Um, so that's an option. Uh, with some liberal arts and smaller colleges, they don't always require you to have a postdoc either. It obviously looks good if you have teaching experience. Um, so if that's your goal, but you don't want to do a postdoc, you can always talk to your advisor about trying to get teaching experience now as a grad student and then try to, you know, you just market that more when you go into, you know, your interview for, you know, a liberal arts uh, or smaller college, like private school um, type of job. Yeah, very cool. Okay, thank you for sharing that. So when you, uh, when you were thinking about this professor position at the, sorry, what, could you tell me what osteopathy is? I, I can't remember. I thought chiropractic and I was like, that's not the same thing. It's kind of in between. They split from medical a long time ago and they focus a little bit more. So back when um, old days of medicine, when they used to think that there were like humors and ghosts in your blood, which we know mm -hmm. humors like humoral component of your immune system. It's the antibodies and stuff like that. They used to think there were ghosts in the blood and medicine way back then used to do bloodletting which does have its place in certain conditions like hemochromatosis and stuff. But osteopathic, like the guy who created it, A.T. Stills was like, my son is sick all the time. They just keep bloodletting. But I feel like that just keeps making him sick, which as we know, like you're making him anemic, like it's not actually helping. He cared more about the whole person. He's like, we just keep treating, but we don't actually try to find the root cause of the condition. And so um, osteopathic medicine focuses more on like holistic and whole body. So if you show up to an osteopathic doctor and your blood pressure's through the roof, obviously, you know, it's a crisis. They're going to put you on meds to take care of you know, the blood pressure. But at the same time, they're going to sit down and ask you about your lifestyle, your behaviors, your stress, your job. Are there other things going on in your life? And they really make fantastic family med docs because, mm. you know, they really sit down with you and try to see the whole person and not just say, hey, you have high blood pressure. We're going to treat it and move you through. Let's sit down and actually like take you holistically, which is part of their tenets. Um, and, and, uh, medical doctors, MDs, um, also, you know, are, are moving more towards that too. I really do like that personalized. They're spending more time with you. Um, but I really do like the osteopathic principles in that, you know, they really have a really good family med, like whole person, uh, like internal med type care. And it's, I think, fantastic. Yeah. 
Very cool. Very cool. So when when you were you were a product stock and you were going on the job market, you had you had this job maybe uh, invited to apply to a job. Did you apply widely or did you just apply to that one job? You did apply. Well, I applied everywhere. Okay. I applied to industry. I applied to a couple. Of little, I like talking about science. Um, yeah. So I applied to a couple of medical science liaison positions. Um, I applied uh, to some. I believe it was DoD. It was a. It was in government alphabet soup. Uh, organization just for uh, like science it was research but like in a specific lab um yeah. i applied to pharma for research too obviously that it was during the pandemic and so a lot of people had hiring freezes or weren't really hiring anybody and so obviously like kind of the only ones that moved through um was this position i don't know actually if anybody ever responded back to the other ones because i stupidly used my uh, postdoc email Oh, no. And I got removed the moment I took a different position. And so yeah. I'll never know if some of these people ever, you know, maybe eventually circle back three or four months later. I was like, hey, we're interested. They'll get a denial email saying this user does not exist. So, yeah. That's who knows? Funny. That's funny. So uh, sorry to go back. How long have you been in this position that you're in right now? I am on my third year now. Okay. Third year, assistant professor. And you're also a lab director or director of research or something? Uh, director of research labs. Um, so we're, we're a newer medical school. Like we started in 2013 uh, and we wanted to increase research presence on campus. Uh, so I wasn't required to come in with external funding, but like I've been writing grants since I got here. Um, but I came in like super excited, young, highly caffeinated, really wanted to get research uh, off the ground here. And I started running my own lab. So I do research and teach um, and because I had such a large lab and I was involved and I was really interested in getting students involved in research, um, that when a position opened up internally um, to move a faculty member into a little bit more admin oversight of the research processes, I applied and I got it. Um, and it basically means I help match medical students with research opportunities on campus or uh, yeah. elsewhere. Um, I just kind of help oversee kind of some of the like safety stuff, um, lab organization where people, you know, where their labs run. Um, you know, I serve on the Institutional Biosafety Committee, too, and just kind of like helping promote research and safety and all that fun stuff. So it's kind of a cool, a cool job to be this young and be in a leadership position. But it's taught me a lot about like admin and like, yeah, there are so many meetings that could have been an email. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind my asking, does that position uh, endow you with like extra salary or a course buyout or both or anything like that? Yes, uh, I get... Um, they talked about course buyout. Um, right now I teach, uh, one course, full course. So three times a week for an hour in the, s the fall and then two courses in the spring. Once is an immuno course. That's three times a week. Mm -hmm. And then once is just a seminar on like science writing. Um, but they give me a stipend for completing that, um, job on top of my other activities and tasks. Very cool. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, any, any other highlights or any other tidbits that you want to throw out regarding like the job you have now, um, you know, why you think it's a job that people should consider, that kind of thing. Well, I know a lot of students worry, and, and this was one of my pressures, because when you consider doing academics for the rest of your life, one of the big things people worry about is, you know, we know what the NIH published postdoctoral salary is because it's published. It's around $50,000. You have a PhD, and a lot of people are like, well, I have a graduate degree. Do I really want to get out of making, you know, around $25,000 a year as a PhD student to making $50,000 a year? Like, mm -hmm. you know, we're older, we want families or whatever, or we want dogs and the house and life. Like, is that enough to be sustainable? Um, and what people don't realize is that, yeah, academia can pay well. It depends on how you market yourself mm. and kind of the institutions you apply for. Definitely no, like uh, community colleges can still pay really well too. It depends on what city it is. And so way out cost of living with that too. Um, but a lot of like medical schools pay well. If you can get a position at a medical school, even if you are serving as a researcher or like research, not research assistant, because you'll be a little bit higher than research scientist, I believe is the title that they'll use where you mm -hmm. may not be running your own lab, but you are considered higher up and you are doing it or you're serving as an instructor, perhaps um, those guys can pay more because uh, I believe starting salary for my position in osteopathic medical school is around 80000 um, nice. That is one of the lower, um, we've recently gotten a survey of all the osteopathic medical schools in the U.S., and I believe are one of the lower <laughs> run mm -hmm. ones, too, or paid, lower paid ones. Um, but I still think that's actually a pretty decent salary um, coming out of 
you know, short postdocs. So it just kind of depends on, on you and your lifestyle and what you want and the comfort. Because I know industry does pay significantly more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but also cost of living of the city you're in can make a huge difference. Um, and there is upward mobility with uh, academia. Like you can get director positions. You can, you know, every year you typically should get a cost of living adjustment or a raise or something. Always ask them what their raise or pay scale uh, rules are um, mm-hmm. or how often you, know, you get a raise. Uh, obviously, if you get an external grant too, you can write more of that into your salary. Um, so there are ways that you can get a higher paying salary as a professor uh, if that's a concern people have about academia. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I think this conversation is really interesting, especially since uh, the last interview. So this will come out in a couple weeks. So it'll be there'll be a couple episodes in between this and the last actual interview I did. But the last interview uh, was with a UX researcher who works in tech and she's making uh, really good money. But as we have definitely seen in the last six months, tech can be really unstable. You know, they go on a hiring spree for a year and then they do a ton of layoffs. And, you know, there's there's definitely a trade in terms of like income and then job stability and job stability in academia is just generally better than industry. Um, So that's definitely something for uh, people to think about. So unless you have something else you want to chat about, I wanted to change directions a little bit. Sounds good. So you mentioned earlier. Uh, which we'll hear at the end of the interview, that you have ADHD. Yes. Okay. How do you feel like, uh, obviously, you know, you only know your own experience, but how do you feel like ADHD, like, helps or hinders or both your experience as an academic and a scientist? I definitely think it depends on the institution, because I have Mm. struggled with it at certain institutions. Um, I know... Thankfully, as a society, we are moving towards being more accepting of neurodivergent thought processes because everyone's Mm. different. You know, sometimes fitting to that nine to five schedule doesn't really work. I got very lucky with the institution I'm at. Like, I don't think you should rule out academia based on like, you know, one bad experience or like kind of an overwhelming, uh, unfortunately negative that like, especially with these larger institutions, if you're not meeting all their metrics or you're working like eight to seven and, and like burning yourself out that you're not successful, um, it can be difficult, especially in those bigger institutions where there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of like, you have to conform to these standards. Um, It can be difficult, but the institution I'm at, like they really value mental health and like not just of students and not like they value faculty too, because they know like, obviously if you are supported and you're thriving in your own way, that they will then thrive. And so I think they're a little bit ahead of the curve and understanding that. Mm. Uh, And it's not something they just slap on their website just to say, oh yeah, we care about mental health. They actually do. Uh, and so, you know, I've been encouraged to talk about my experiences with it. Like at, at previous institutions, I felt pressure to kind of hide it and not tell people because like, you know, when you apply for a job and they're always like, do you want to self-identify as having a disability? Like, am I going to mm-hmm. be discriminated? Like, I know they can't, but you always worry in the back of your head, like, are they going to discriminate against me if I say something? And this was the first place where I was like, they, they encouraged me to say something. They're like, we want you to like, like, we want you to talk about this because students who come through have ADHD and we don't want them to feel this pressure to hide and if you can be this this voice in the space saying, hey, you can do this. I did it. Like, let's figure out a way to make it work for you. We, we can do this. It works better for the students, too. And they feel more supported and they feel more encouraged mm-hmm. and they do better. And it's like it's that self-fulfilling prophecy, but it, it works in their favor and it's good. So I like their their model and their style. Yeah, very cool. Well, uh, do you have any tips or tricks for folks with ADD or ADHD on how to be successful in an academic environment? Yes. Uh, there's a lot of different tips and tricks I can say. Um, I typically tend to work better. Like 9am is not a thing for me. I do not do well. I do not function well. So I don't schedule important things at 9am. I've booked off that time for me to kind of ease into stuff. So if, if, cause ADHD is the typical uh, delayed sleep phase disorder and like kind of the skewed mm-hmm. circadian rhythm that we ideally like to sleep from like 2am to 10am. Uh, and so, you know, if that's your style of ADHD, you know, spend time with yourself on what works for you and what time works for you. If you know you're most like active and and good at writing at three in the afternoon, bookmark that time. And that's what you're going to do. You're going to write that. Like don't try to fight yourself and like fight even harder. Like I'm going to write at nine in the morning when I'm half awake and I don't want to be here. And like the writing is going to suck. Find out what works for you. And, and you know, if you're most productive at night, okay, cool. 
work on some littler tasks you can do throughout the day where you're still doing what you need to do for your job that, you know, writing at 10 o'clock at night works best for you. Dedicate an hour at 10 o'clock at night um, to write. Um, and I think also to being honest with like your boss about what, what you need, um, you know, that as long as you get your job done and you're, you're meeting your metrics and like, it's like, I may be functioning a little bit differently from everybody else you've, you've worked with, but I get it done and this is how I get it done. And, and a lot of times too, if you're honest, that can help. Um, I also think scheduling breaks, um, don't work for more than an hour at a time, get up and walk around every hour. I mean, they've also showed you shouldn't sit on your butt the whole day anyway. You should be moving around. It's better for your health and longevity. Um, sometimes 30 minutes is as far as I can do. And it's like, be patient with yourself that, you know, you did try your best. You worked for 30 minutes. If you need to get up and do a lap around your office floor or go downstairs, get a drink, come back up or go to the bathroom, um, that, you know, movement away and then coming back can be a good reset. And it's just like finding out what works for you time-wise and then scheduling that in. And then being patient and, and accommodating that, like, hey, what if you have a really bad day? You didn't sleep well the night before. You know, you're really not functioning that well. The ADHD is all over the place, whatever. Be patient with yourself because, you know, if you keep trying to feel guilty about all the things you're not accomplishing, it just kind of spirals. Um, and just kind of reset and just say, hey, like, you know, I'll start fresh next hour or I'll start fresh tomorrow and I will just catch up. Um, and so I think there are ways that you can make it work. I'm also like, we like dopamine schedule things make it fun make a game out of it i love mm, crossing things yeah. off my to-do list like there's such a good surge of dopamine yeah. if i cross something off make a to-do list but add stupid stuff in that you'll feel good about like i threw away a piece of paper today adding those I little things that. in on top of the big stuff can help motivate you it's like okay finish the methods paper method section of your paper then throw something away or like eat a cookie as like having those little stupid things scheduled in too can kind of help because you're like, oh yeah, I feel productive. Like I'm crossing all these mm -hmm. things off. Just like I threw away a piece of paper. Great. <laughs> but it could have been, been a piece of paper that's been sitting here for two months that I just can't bring myself to throw away. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I feel like, and I, I, I'm not diagnosed with ADHD or ADD, but I once was asked if I had it, but that's besides the point. Um, yeah, I think I've asked you too. Uh, I, somebody told me, I've heard this a couple of times, but it's like some, there are these people that swear by like full, uh, making your bed in the morning, which I do not make my bed. In the, I don't think I've made my bed since I was like 12 years old, but um, that doing like a little task that you can complete. It's easy. You can look at it. You can say, Hey, I'm done. For me, it's probably like running the dishwasher, but um, you know, having something where you can be like, Oh, look, I'm done. I started, I finished, I feel better because so much of what we work on in ac and I'm not in academia anymore, but so much in what we work on in academia, but also in industry is, are these huge long projects that like don't always have a definitive end date. Maybe we don't necessarily see like the product at the very end. Um, and so having that like dopamine hit, I know for me is just like so valuable. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing we struggle with is, We'll have a big task and we obviously know how to get that task done but it's prioritizing which pieces are important of that task and what mm -hmm. order they should be done and i had a psychiatrist who said one of the best things i've ever done she goes literally write out everything like obviously this mm -hmm. is a big task you need to write a grant okay great write down every single component of it and like even yeah. like even if you're bouncing all the place you're like oh yeah that's right i have to remember to write a title page or like i have to remember to sign my name she doesn't she's like free flow thought just write everything that you can think of down that you need to do for it and she said, then if you're really struggling with like, what is an important, like clearly, you know, me writing my name on the page or signing it can be done at the end. Like, that's not something that has to be done right the second. She said, if you really struggle with it, you know, bring it to one of your colleagues or a friend um, who might be better able to say, hey, this should move up here. Like, don't yeah. order it at first, just free flow thought everything down. And then you and a friend can sit down and kind of actually number and order. Like, this is the steps that should happen. This is the priority because we can often like, it's like, oh yeah, I gotta do the dishes. I gotta do the laundry. I gotta do this. Like I gotta make dinner. It's like, but what is important and critical for right this second? Hmm. So we can get overwhelmed in like all the little details, having someone there to also just be like, Hey, like write everything down and then go back and like order what is actually important. Like clearly you need to eat. That should probably move up to the top. That should be more of a priority. You can't do things if you're hungry. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, you know, dishes don't have to be done today, or I have clothes to wear. I don't have to do laundry, but I have to pack my kids' lunches. Like, so things like that, that are, you know, clearly you have to feed, you have to go to the bathroom, sure. you know, important life 
things, yeah. um, move those up and do those first. So I do think that's a really good advice too. Okay. So I, I'm interested. Do you have any, like any other, so I am asking genuinely, I am also fishing, but uh, do you have any like habits that you do that you feel like, uh, like bring you focus or organization or like on taskness or getting in flow state or anything like that? Um, tapping my foot. That's, I do that constantly. It helps me kind of sit down, but also having a space that I'm like, this is my, like, I always tell myself, like, if I'm, I'm sitting in this spot and I'm wearing like my blue light glasses and I've got like this music playing that like, I tell myself like, that's my peak. And even though okay. I'm probably lying to myself, but like, I'm like, I feel more studious when I put my blue light glasses on. I'm like, I feel more focused. Or if I have headphones and listen to a specific time, I usually do like classical music and stuff like that, where there's no words, but there's something sure. in the background. Um, or study like lo-fi stuff um, to have that, then like, I feel really productive if I do that. Uh, and then I also forgot the beginning of your question. Um, me too. Yeah, just habits or, uh, yeah, anything that gets you like in flow state or organized or focused, yeah. Uh, the other thing I do, I have a really cool, because I like writing things down. I used to do sticky mm -hmm. notes, which is the worst thing you could ever do with an ADHD person because I will lose the sticky notes. And then I find a stack of sticky notes from like grad school. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, clearly something important. Like there's a number written on here. Clearly it's important. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember. Um, and so the other thing I like to do, I got, they have this like little paper pad um, and it's called like my shit list. I'll send you the link so you can post it if you want to. It's like 10 bucks on Amazon, but it's like easy shit, tough shit oh shit and like it lets oh, you rank funny. stuff and it's, it's a to-do list that you can check off but it's kind of yeah. funny and so like I get colorful markers and on my to-do list for the day I like sort like this is easy like oh emailing someone okay probably easy or maybe oh shit um you know grading this assignment it's going to take a lot of brain power I don't want to do it oh shit and so like I can go through there and I try to like cross out one easy one tough one oh and then like loop through but I just think it's it's and it, it's cursing so it makes it a little bit more fun and exciting for me sure uh, and then colored markers and just like anything that makes it just a little bit outside of monotony, uh, I think is good. So brightly colored markers and uh, whiteboards, big whiteboards to just like mm. write your thoughts all over are fun. I've been creeping on the background. I was like, you could definitely put up a gigantic whiteboard and like build yeah. a doctor's house on it and just write out everything. I do. I have two. I'm not talking to the mic. I have two, um, but they're in the back room somewhere. But yeah, I bust them out every once in a while and use them. But the thing that's like, and I don't know if this is like neurotypical or whatever. The thing I've been doing is, um, I don't see my journal, but I've been doing morning pages. Do you know what morning pages is? Is that journaling in the morning? It is. Yeah. It's a specific uh, journaling style. Julia Cameron wrote about it in The Artist's Way. It's a book that she wrote about. And she originally fashioned it for artists, but then Tim Ferriss talks about it now, like every bro ever you know, does it, but, um, Oh, here it is. It's just like, you grab just like a cheap notebook and you do three handwritten pages of stream of consciousness thoughts. First thing in the morning, before you look at your phone, before you look at your news, um, before you like, just dump more crap in your brain. Yeah. And I, I found that like, I walk away from it. So just so like clear up here. I, I also, I kind of cheat. I'll have like another thing next to me and I'll basically write out bulleted to do's because they'll pop in my head and then I'll get like fixated on it until I write it down. But um, that to me has been a lifesaver. And I don't always do three pages. Sometimes I just do one page. But yeah, but yeah, sometimes there's just like so much going on up here that I feel like I have to just like clean the slate completely. I but, like that. I've never tried it in the morning. I also don't think I function enough in the morning to, to function. Yeah. Um, at night, though, that's what I do. When Interesting. Like, I can't sleep. Because so I'm like, every single thing I haven't done throughout the day, I'm like, oh, crap, did I pay my taxes? Did I you know, pay that water bill, blah, 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 but little things I'm gonna forget. Did I buy enough toilet paper for next week? Whatever. I have a notepad next to my bed. And as those thoughts pop up, I literally sit down and will like, just write them down. So that way I can go to sleep and not just keep replaying in my head. Like, Oh, did I remember to get Greek yogurt at the grocery store? Um, I have that list for in the morning that I have to be like, Oh yeah, these are easy things I can do throughout the day. Like yeah. I'm not overwhelmed. So I flip flop it. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if this is a millennial thing. I, I feel like Gen Z will come up and then we'll be able to do experiments on them and actually be able to tell. But I, I feel like there's something to do with physically writing shit down that just like makes it more meaningful. Um, I, I can remember stuff I wrote down, but well, I have a really bad memory, but I can't, I can remember stuff I write down probably 10 X for the time 
that I remember stuff I typed out. I can't remember anything I've ever typed out. Um, I think and I, I don't have know. done studies on that. I think really? that's why, like, my, my college said they didn't want us to have computers and tablets in class. Interesting. But they could also have been lying to me, and I just took it as, as fact because mm-hmm. I was a impressionable college kid. Um, but and it will also be interesting to see now because my school gives all of our students tablets that they write on. So they're not mm. typing, they're writing. But it'd be interesting to see is, it, is there a difference between writing on paper yeah. and writing on, which is not, it's killing trees, or writing on a tablet where you're still getting the, the kinesthetic writing. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know. I heard I heard someone talking about it and I can't remember if they thought this or I thought this, but I feel like to really know we have to because we grew up like doing handwriting, like did you do cursive in elementary school? Did do you remember cursive? Like, that really bad paper too that they had? It was like thin and it was like brownish, but like with the lines no. like the blue and they had the pink in the middle and you had to like I do remember that. You yeah. Had to, like, you had for your L's you, you had to hit certain top. points yeah no I do remember that see and yeah and so the idea was that um maybe when we were young we just like took in that mode of like putting information out of our heads as like the meaningful thing and maybe kids if they like you know start tapping on a screen earlier or typing on a keyboard Maybe that will become the meaningful thing, but I don't know. The old man in me is like, nah, I'll just write it down. But yeah, because another thing I'm know. traumatized from the your L's, you're gonna lose points if your L doesn't start here. Oh yeah. Hit the top, come right back up, but you can't go over. Right. No, I, I never write in cursive except my signature. I mean, that's like, and that's barely in cursive. It's just like, bleh. yeah. Anyway, well, that was a great team. The other thing I think yeah. that contributes to anxiety in millennials. Do you remember that game that it was like you had to fit the puzzle pieces into the little slots and you had a timer and if not, the whole thing blew up in your face? Did you ever yes. Uh, 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 I don't remember the name, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know either. If you told me, I'd believe it, but I actually remember We had a lot of anxiety inducing games. <laughs> uh, even the operation. man where you, uh, yes, operation. Yeah. 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 I'm pretty sure they just created us to be anxious millennials yeah. as adults yeah that's funny you're not perfect so, you don't put the triangle the triangle blows up in your face right exactly so uh interesting segue how do you do you experience anxiety on a frequent basis okay i think it was worse before i kind of realized it was adhd like i got diagnosed mm-hmm. in high school because uh, yeah. i've always been a high performer and so like even though like the signs are there like i have you know note cards from kindergarten where we had like red yellow and green cards green was good Yellow was, <laughs> red was bad. And every single week we got graded on the card, like green, yellow, or red. And cons- I was in a constant state of like yellow. It's like, it won't sit in her chair. Yeah. Interrupts the teacher, like can't sit still, keeps tapping the chair in front of her and the student in front of her hates her. Um, stuff like that. And it's like, the signs are always there. Um, but I did well in school. And so they didn't think about it until high school when I struggled, started to struggle with like calculus and stuff like that. Uh, and having to fit more into that box of like, oh, you have to function nine to five. You have to, mm. this, you have to fit this. I think it gave me a lot of anxiety because I was trying so desperately hard to be good and to fit in into something that, you know, it, I was trying to put a square peg into a triangle and it didn't work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so now that I've accepted it and I'm more open and honest about it, there's that less pressure that I have to conform and, and the anxiety is obviously lifted a little bit more since I can like be myself. And if I tell my boss like, Hey, you know, if you need to have like a very important meeting with me at 9 a.m., I cannot guarantee, like, I'm really sorry, but I can't guarantee you that I'm going to be fully there for it. If you mm. push it to 10, I can be there. I can, you know, be fully functioning on, you know, on my A game. Um, and, and I think that's really helped a lot because then I don't feel as pressured to be perfect mm-hmm. and I'm able to work with myself more. Mm. What, what other things do you do that help you manage anxiety? Gym. I gym. gym every yeah. single day yeah. um, even if I don't feel like lifting weights um, just hopping on the treadmill and just walking just doing something physical just to wear mm-hmm. myself out and just be tired uh, I definitely think helps a lot I highly think I mean I think uh, lifting weights is ideal for ADHD there's no like science behind it this is totally just anecdotal but it's like you're mm-hmm. physically burning yourself out lifting heavy weights Yeah. but when your muscles are tired like feels good it helps get rid of some of that extra anxiety and, and just because we're like going all the time, mm-hmm. um, that it just kind of helps slow us down and calm us down, I think. 
Interesting. Do you do group fitness at all or just solo? Uh, mixture. I usually have a buddy that goes with me just because okay. it's, um, <clears throat> I mean, we do better with group fitness because there's that pressure from the group yeah. to, to be there. Uh, but I think just having any kind of accountability is good and having a buddy or doing a group fitness class where they're like, Hey, you said you'd be here. Where are you? Helps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Uh, so I, I have a couple questions and then we'll go to Instagram for some other stuff. Um, favorite workout music rock rock what kind of rock um i currently love like memphis mayfire i prevail yeah. bring me the horizon skillet things like that um but last night i pr into a bunch of 80s rock hmm. so i guess it's just kind of all rock <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah no and that that's the, one of the things that we've connected over uh is like mid to late 2000s some metal core but some like emo core and screamo and all it's of that not stuff a phase mom yeah yeah exactly uh well, who who are your favorite bands from that era oh from that era i really liked skillet and red red um, yeah yeah they were kind of on the border um sleeping with sirens is pretty good i started getting more into rock later i think oh, okay um, but like I did like female front and I'm trying to remember obviously Paramore was big. Mm-hmm. Evanescence was kind of the Evanescence was the gateway. Evanescence drug. dude. Yeah. Gateway drug. Um there was one other Hey Monday was a pop punk mm. band from back then. I think the artist went on to a solo career in country, which is interesting. Interesting. Um I'm trying to think of some other ones. Did yeah, you fly leaf? for a while. Oh yeah, Flyleaf, yes. Flyleaf, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um Okay, let's go over to Instagram before I get more distracted. So your first question, I had it pulled up a second ago. Okay. Um, This is from a person who's currently pursuing their PhD in soil microbes. So this is a little bit of a different field. Um, But what career options do you think are the best for those kinds of folks after the PhD. So maybe not just soil microbes, but kind of everyone in that like biosciences realm. Well, no, I can't get over soil. Um, oh. I, on soil. I mean, do, do you know soil stuff? I do. Well, so I did for, okay. uh, I, well, we were collecting E. coli from chicken poop in the soil. Uh, huh. And then I did some like uh, lactococcus uh, and listeria experiments in, in uh, college. Um, but some of the jobs that I know you can get with soil scientists specifically can be with like regulatory agencies like USDA. Um, USDA is a big one actually for that because, mm. and they pay well, um, because again, like if you specialize, it depends on like what bacteria you specialize in too. Um, but also any kind of ecology job, you can teach it. We do have a soil scientist here at the school that I work at. She's more on the undergrad side of things. Um, but you can't teach in academia, but if you're looking for more financial stability, it'd probably be like USDA, um, yeah. <clears throat> or NIH or some of those guys, um, just because it's a big thing. Or you could potentially go into like private sectors, but related to farming and agriculture, because those can mm-hmm. also help you well too. Yeah, uh, there was a, so I, a year ago, I was a writing coach for a brief stint. I don't know if you remember me making content during that period. Anyway, moved on from that. But one of the people that I worked with uh, actually was at UNL where I did my research scientist position and I was in the social sciences, but um, she was in uh, soil. She was getting a master's in soil, something having to do with soil. But um, it reminded me of when I was at UNL, whenever I was like, it's time for me to get out of academia. I was starting to like look at my career options and I went to a like startup incubator called, it's not an incubator, but it's called 1 million cups and it's like a monthly or weekly gathering of entrepreneurs around the world um, where they take turns doing presentations of startups and that kind of thing. And dude, so many ag tech startups up there. Of course, it's Nebraska. So, you know, ag is huge up there. But they were doing like crazy cool stuff with science that w- was maybe a little bit jumping a little bit further than maybe where like the academic research was, which is, I think, kind of common in some of those spaces. but. Um, I don't know. They were doing such cool stuff and there's tons of dollar signs behind it. Cause if you can, you know, make ag that much more efficient or anything, then, you know, that's a, that's a huge, huge lever that you can pull for that industry. But, um, 
I don't know what the jobs are like there, but that popped into my head whenever I was thinking about soil science. So another common question I get from Instagram is how to handle toxicity in academia. And I don't know what your experience in academia is like, but um, let's say hypothetically you ran into some, what, what do you think are the best ways to handle that kind of a thing? Yeah, there's a lot because huh? there is overwhelming toxicity. And I've been at places that they've had that where students were kind of ignored, um, you know, with sexual assault allegations. And instead of, you know, removing the professor, it's just, oh, we'll just put them on emeritus status and like yeah. not let them take any more students, um, which is not addressing the problem. Um, I definitely think it's good to have a network and support system, um, especially if you're the one experiencing it, uh, having a therapist and just someone that's a safe place that you can talk to and vent about is fantastic because you shouldn't have to like carry that burden alone. And with therapy, as long as you're not threatening to hurt yourself or others, they they can't release it. It's, you know, patient confidentiality. And so it's a good place to kind of go, um, try to find some trusted person at your institution, um, you know, it may not always feel like there's someone there, but more than likely there's someone around, um, whether it's in your department or elsewhere, that may, you know, just be that that point of support. Um, if it gets really serious, obviously you can try talking to a lawyer uh, and see. Obviously, I wouldn't encourage anyone to stay with, uh, I mean, if it's really that bad as a culture and you don't see it changing, you can leave. Absolutely. Like, it's not up to you to single-handedly change uh, the toxic culture there. Uh, plus, once you leave, you know, you could always bring it back up again and like highlight uh, once you're in a safe place and you like don't feel like you're you know, your job's at risk if you say anything um potentially start bringing it up after the fact or like mm -hmm. in an exit interview um you know i would encourage you to try to report it to hr um but again some people don't feel comfortable doing that or feel like their hr is there to support them um some institutions have things called ombudsman which are supposed to be on your side granted it's not always the case um, but that could be someone you try to reach out to and see uh, or if you know anybody who kind of went through a similar experience, see what their experience was, what they did, what they would want to do differently and things like that. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I feel kind of, we're, we're, we're almost at time and I feel like one of the, the biggest takeaways uh, that folks could garnish right now is that you've, you've done the moonshot of going from grad student to postdoc to professor. So for all those folks listening out there who are ignoring my cries about how everyone should go to industry um, and they want to stay in academia, what do you think grad students should be doing to best prepare themselves for getting those academic jobs? I definitely think they should find out what they want. And again, like what kind of academic job do they want? R01? Do they want, you know, osteopathic medical school? Do they want small liberal arts? Um, <clears throat> AAAS is a really good free a tool. It's called My IDP, which stands for My Individual Development Plan. You can mm. make an account, and it is a really cool tool where you can actually rank things you value. So you personally get to choose. Like, do you value more family time? Do you, you know, better work life balance? Do you like recognition for your work? And then it also has you rank your skill set, uh, and then it shows you jobs that match up with what you value and what your high skill sets are. But it also shows you some jobs that, like, hey, you value, but your skill sets are not that high you know, what would you need to do to kind of boost the skill sets to make you more competitive to like kind of fit into that role? And so it also has kind of like explore careers options. So if you're not really sure, you know, what you want to do or say you're considering academia, but you're not sure what aspect of academia or if maybe <clears throat> you like teaching, but you want to do policy, which you're talking about science or MSL, medical science liaison, where you're still talking about science and you're still teaching, um, you can find ways to do that. Or you like research, but you don't want to teach. I think it's a really cool, good tool to kind of figure out where you are and then it also has uh, tools and tasks for making like actionable six month, one year, five year plans. Um, so that's your goal. I think it's just a great resource to, to use um, to start planning for the direction you want to go. Hmm. Very cool. Okay. Was there anything that you wanted to talk about today that we did not get to? I think we're good. Cool. Cool. All right. So the last question for you, Elizabeth, what is something that you think all grad students should consider doing before they are done with their PhD. Could be professional, could be fun, could be both, could be something else. I think they, I don't, there's not one thing I think they should do. I think they should just pick one thing that scares them and do it. Hmm. Um, whether it's traveling to a new place or presenting at a conference they don't think they're eligible for, or, you know, writing a paper that they don't think, um, you know, they have enough data for. The worst they can say is no. 
and you never know what's going to happen. Like I say, you're not sure. Like, oh, I don't want to apply. Like, I don't think I do. I qualify for this job. Um, or I don't think I'm eligible for this scholarship or award or whatever. Apply. Do one thing that scares you. You know, fuck around, find out. Yeah. <laughs> Put your shot into it. And uh, more than likely, you might be pleasantly surprised and end up as a professor without realizing you ever wanted to be a professor and loving yeah. it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me, Elizabeth. I hope you can't hear that ding of that text message that just came in. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, so folks can find you and I'll have links on the in the episode description that you can scroll down to and click if you're listening. Um, so you are active on Instagram. I know Twitter. Are you still active there? Not yeah. since the takeover. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if um, folks want to LinkedIn, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay. So then yeah. uh, we'll list those and any other places that you want to send folks. Actually, they, if they are looking for professor positions in biochemistry, physiology, and anatomy, we are hiring three professors in those positions. And I'd be willing to put in a good word after talking Very to cool. them, like not just a stranger. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so for folks interested in that, do you want them to reach out on Instagram? Instagram. Or yeah, probably Instagram? Be- Okay. Check out my LinkedIn. Very cool. All right. Well, definitely make sure to put that on there. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for chatting with me. It was good to finally meet you on video. And um, I'm sure we'll talk again in the future. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. Folks, thank you for tuning into the Grad School Sucks podcast. I hope you got a lot out of our episode today. If you did, please consider leaving a rating or a view on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to check out the description of this episode for links to everything that we covered today. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Matt Carlson, and I look forward to bringing you another great episode next week. See y'all next time.